My name is Rana Faruhar. I'm the Assistant Managing Editor at Time Magazine in charge of Business and Economics and I have the great pleasure of being here to speak mm -hmm. with Professor Chris Pisarides from the London School of Economics, a Nobel Laureate who I'm sure many of you know and, and probably many of you know his work as well. Um, the professor won the Nobel for his work in labor economics and it's very interesting. I'm just going to give a little bit of background before mm -hmm. we move on to your new idea because I, I find it fascinating. He won for um, questioning um, the fact, which was conventional economic theory, that if you had an open job and an unemployed worker, they would inevitably mm -hmm. come together. <coughs> and you were the first, one of the first, to, to really mm -hmm. question this, and, and much of what you found is now a conventional wisdom in, in labor economics. So um, the professor is going to share a new idea, a breakthrough idea, with us today on employment and how to make the jobs that are being created now better jobs. So I turn it to you. Thank you. Thank you, Rana. Um, I mean, the idea what's been worrying me about uh, recently in the last um, about five or six years now is where are the jobs going to come from that will employ the young workers coming out of school. Uh, my focus has been the um, industrialized countries of the OECD, mainly Europe and how it compares with the United States, Japan I looked at. Um, and, and, and this, you know, to give you a little bit of the historia, historical background, if, you, if we look back in the age of manufacturing, which was say, up to the 1970s when it started declining in, in our countries. But many, many young people, the unskilled, the ones who left school early, were, they were expecting to go into manufacturing or mining. They were becoming manual workers, very little skill, maybe a little bit of apprentice, apprenticeship uh, training. And then you got your job and you stayed there. And it's probably what your uh, father was doing. Uh, your mother was not likely to be working. And, and, and society sort of knew what to expect in terms of employment. Now, that route to a job, of course, has ended now, following the um, oil shocks of the 70s and the decline of manufacturing, and especially in the last decade with globalization and the movement of manufacturing jobs to um, China, in India, and other places. And, and we have to realize that manufacturing jobs are not going to come back to uh, the industrialized, industrialized countries of the OECD. So uh, young people will have to go into services. Then you might say, what kind of services? Well. What's the most striking thing about service employment when we look around us is, is computerization. We see computers everywhere, electronics. So is the, so the obvious thing that might occur to you when you see it is to say, well, it's going to be in these uh, services, so let's give them education, let's uh, supply all schools with computers, and, and the employment problem will be solved. And in fact, that's the approach that the European Union has taken in the Lisbon treaty is the approach that individual European Union leaders took. Tony Blair, when he was elected prime minister, he said, you know, they asked him what's the, um, it was going to be the initiative of your government. He said, education, 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 a computer in every school for every child. You know, and it was driven by the whole European Union um, uh, push for um, what they call good jobs. That. Now, if you look at the statistics, though, that's not the case. Mm. If you look at the statistics, and especially statistics from the United States because the United States is still the leading economy of the world in terms of where uh, job creation is going to go, which sectors are going to develop. And usually Europe follows uh, closely behind another 10-year gap maybe in employment. I mean, historically you can see that. If you look at where jobs are being created, they are mostly in um, unskilled services that involve some kind of service provision for the individual or, or, or the business. So what you're describing is a world of services um, moving towards the high end. Um, and you've said some very provocative things. We can't bring manufacturing back in rich countries. I mean, President Obama just gave a State of the Union speech that was telling us that we could, and there are a lot of companies yeah. that disagree with that. You've, you've also said yeah. that I think that we can't innovate our way out of the end of manufacturing and the shrinking middle problem mm -hmm. and we can't potentially educate our way completely out. Is, mm -hmm. that, is that right? It's right. Those are big statements. <laughs> yes, so I how don't do know we... why, I, I don't know how President Obama, I mean he's, I, I don't know how he could think that you would bring manufacturing back. I mean you, you see, you see we, have, we have to be a little bit careful here actually because you, you definitely cannot bring back big numbers of jobs in manufacturing. You could bring back, or rather, you could um, have high-tech manufacturing 
in, in, in our countries that, that countries like China don't have the capability of producing now. But when, when you look at the number of jobs, though, that they generate, mm. even in Germany, you see a line that comes straight down. It, it, the number of mm. jobs involved in these famous export industries of Germany, they are shrinking all the time. That's interesting. So do you think that this, we should all be Germans model mm. is, is overblown? It, it, it's not overblown in terms of exports and uh, generating value added, generating products that, that um, other countries want to buy so that we can get before an exchange and buy all the cheap products that we're not producing. That's, mm. that's basically the German, mm -hmm. the, the mm -hmm. German model. Um, but it's, it's overblown in terms of um, where the jobs are coming from. The big number of jobs in labor-intensive sectors will always be in these non-tradable kind of services. You cannot trade uh, health mm. services, mm. you cannot trade the personal service you get when you go to the gym. That, that's where So uh, sectors that are not are exposed created. to global competition, yeah. basically. Yeah, I, I, exactly. And yeah. many of these uh, jobs that you've mentioned, home health aides, retail jobs, they're relatively low-paying jobs. Mm. So what, what are the ramifications of that? How do we fix that? Well, well, well that, that, that's exactly what the challenge is now in, in terms of um, m making those jobs more respectable for, for young people who come out of school. Now, one thing that that you have to uh, that we always have to remember is that in, in, inequality in the marketplace is inevitable. What's different now is that the the expectation of the young people might might be disappointed because that's not the kind of job they might e expect to get. And there is also this fear that you are going to work for a, this this big employer who has experience and employs thousands of people. And what protection do you have if that employer mm. uh, squeezes you? Mm. And so these are the challenges. And thinking yeah. then about the insights as you've as you've mm. contemplated this problem, how do you go from here to there? How do you affect that cultural change and, and make these jobs <clears throat> better? Okay, there it, it, you you have to take a um, a, a multi-dimensional approach as, it, as we are in affecting it, these jobs in making them more respectable, raise their pay, and, and that's what I've sort of been spending more of, more of, of my thinking time now doing it rather than doing it with. Now, now, first of all, you have to start with schools mm -hmm. and change the um, type of education that we give in, in high school, in secondary school, mm -hmm. to um, be more geared to this um, kind of job. You know, given, give basic training in, um, in, in, in health, you know, in, in demographics, hmm. uh, longevity, you know, life expectancy, all, all these things we, we, we don't teach anything at all uh, in, in our schools. Um, talk more about uh, how respectable this is, you know, rather than spend all your time at least in um, in English schools, but English schools, but I'm sure the same everywhere. It's just I'm more familiar with those because I had mm. children who went through the system. Mm -hmm. um, you know, tell them about the great industrial nation and uh, how people used to go to the factory and work and all that. Uh, t tell them more about what's going on now. You know, mm. the, the, that we have less the, mythologizing. The, uh, yeah, so so that expectations are geared in that direction. You know, I had so two children who went through the. Um, the entire education system in London, and, and neither had any idea about these things when they mm. came out of school. It, it, it was not uh, mentioned at all. So that, that's so interesting. That's, that, yeah. So, so so that's the more long long term. The, and and, and what, what's interesting is that we had a meeting just uh, a, a little while ago with um, CEOs of companies, and when they asked them what did they think government could do most to help them in their recruitment, they mentioned precisely this point that that the secondary school education. It's being outdated, and, and government could modernize it by um, teaching things that are more in tune with uh, where industrial society is going today. Now that's one. Now, now, the, now the second thing that um, government could do, uh, uh, actually, and, they, and I've become a great supporter of this, is the minimum wage. Mm. Now, now the minimum wage, it, it could be a dangerous policy if it's too high. 
What about social safety nets too? I mean, we hear the story we hear in the states all the time. Actually, mentions the the the, the coffee shop with the that starts with an S and how they give healthcare to everyone. We hear a lot about that and the benefits. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> would you like to see more companies making those kinds of jobs um, have a better social safety net? My preference is closer to the um, Danish system. They, they invented the term flex security for it, <coughs> mm. where the um, where the company is concerned only with employment and um, with enhancing your productivity through the training of the company itself, paying you a reasonable wage. But then if the company doesn't need the job anymore, it closes the job down and, and the state through the um, uh, social security or national insurance as we call it, um, the south of the Atlantic, um, gives uh, a, a social safety net uh, to, to the individual. Now that might be in the form of income support and um, then after a while it's in the form of helping with job search. Now that, that leaves a health provision of course mm. and that's the big question, the 64 million dollar question mm. <laughs> that, mm. that, of, of our Western countries because health provision was traditionally in many countries provided uh, by the state but and that's how the safety net was, but it's obviously becoming too expensive for the state now to support that the whole range of services and, uh, and uh, both healthcare and um, health services that, that you might need because, as we were saying before, uh, demand is going up. I think there, the, there should be a minimum safety, safety net uh, hmm. for health services rather than rely on the employer providing them. But there should be a mix of uh, state and, uh, and public, otherwise taxation will just be too high to Well, finance. I was going to actually turn to tax. What, are, what should be done with tax policy as regards these types of jobs? Um, I think we could um, raise the uh, minimum income at which uh, tax payment begins. Don't even ask them to fill in paperwork if they're um, self-employed, if they do it on their own. You know, you have the self-employed nanny, for example, who looks after mm. the baby maybe a few weeks, maybe months. Yes, in one household goes to another. If pay is below a certain level that is fairly high, don't um, uh, ask them to have to keep accounts and declare it as well. Just have it as a tax-free pay. Most of them will hide their income anyway if you mm. ask them to do it. <laughs> so why don't you just mm. join them if you can't mm. beat them, you know? And, um, and, and then have higher uh, t taxes hi uh, higher up the scale. Now that also applies for um, big employers that, um, that you might say, okay, fair enough for the self-employed, what about the employer? But that also applies there. Let, you know, give them social security holidays, as we call them, so they don't pay uh, social security tax hmm. uh, until they reach a certain level of income. Well, Professor, I want to thank you so much. It's a pleasure mm -hmm. to speak with you, and we thank you for your ideas. Mm -hmm. Thank you.